If you want, you can turn off your video so you won't be on the recording, but we love seeing your faces. So keep them on if you're comfortable with that. We do ask that all participants are stay muted during the presentations. If you have questions, comments during the talk, please put those into the chat box. Um, you should see an icon at the bottom of your screen uh, for the chat box, and we'll make sure we get to those at the end of the presentation. Um, we'll also open up for questions. People can speak and, and dialogue at that time after the presentation. But before we go any further, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that the magnificent St. Louis River and estuary has been home to the Anishinaabe people and the Dakota and Northern Cheyenne before them, a revered waterway known as Gichigami Azibi or the Great Lake River holds great spiritual and personal significance for its original stewards. And we all benefit today from those who cared for the land, the air, and the water. We honor and respect them as custodians, past and present. And we also respect the science and knowledge that has been learned, passed down through thousands of years and continues to this day. So we're grateful to be here tonight. Before I hand the screen over to our presenters, I just want to remind folks of who we are as the St. Louis River Alliance. We're a membership organization committed to protecting and restoring the St. Louis River. We work on a variety of habitat projects like piping plover monitoring, wild rice planting, in addition to hosting lots of stewardship events um, and inviting the community to come out and connect with the river. We're proud managers of the St. Louis River National Water Trail and continue to collaborate with state, tribal, and federal agencies to delist the St. Louis River as an area of concern. And tonight's presentation is part of our Water Wednesday series. We've been having these for a few months now. And starting next month in June, the series is going to literally go on the water. Um, if you want to know more and join us for those paddling events on the St. Louis River Estuary, they'll be guided. Um, go to our webpage and please register. Um, and you can learn more about us there as well, of course. Uh, so that's enough about us. Uh, without further ado, I would like to turn this over to our presenters. Heidi is going to kick it off tonight um, and then she'll be followed uh, by Gina. So thank you for being here. Thank you for, for presenting tonight, Heidi and Gina. Thank you. Um, let's see, I wanna be able to see the chat. There we go. Um, I'll share my screen. Hopefully this will work. <laughs> and okay. Oops. All right. Um, well, I, the, there are so many people, um, that have been so involved with, you know, the river and, um, I just want to say that as a historian, this is not really my, my uh, field of expertise exactly, this particular part, but I do spend a lot of time on the river and I do, um, I do do a lot of research on general Duluth history, uh, local history. So, um, and Gina is like an expert on Clough Island and I, so I hope she'll chime in when I, if I bring anything up that she knows better. Um, I've also done a lot of uh, Tony Durkins and his research on early um, Fond du Lac and the Fond du Lac neighborhood and those things. Also, all my pictures that I am showing, unless I say otherwise, are from the uh, Northeast Minnesota Historical Society archives. Um, and yeah, so. Uh, Basically, I borrowed this from Tony Durkins from his upcoming book. It's a map in his new book coming out that's uh, called uh, the Duluth Aerial Bridge. Um, hey, and hey, I'm just going to catch you a second. I, you're not sharing your scheme, machine screen at oh, this I'm point. Not. I'm not. Okay. Nope. <sighs> Why? Why did that not work? Let's try again.
now? Okay. All right. Yep. There we go. So this is um from this is what I was saying from Tony Durkins, he, uh, his an illustration that he put together that shows better than anything I could put together about where uh, the various Ojibwe uh, camps and villages were. But basically, um, when it comes to the St. Louis River, I spend most of my time on the river. So I'm thinking from the river to other things, like, like I'm speaking sort of from that perspective. Um, so when I talk about development and stuff, I'm kind of thinking more like, thank goodness it didn't go and take off the way that it was it was going to. Um, so when the Ice Age retreats, you've got um, the Paleo Age, uh, Eastern Archaic Native American, 7,000 BC, right? Then the Woodland Mound Builders, 3,000 years ago, the Dakota are the descendants and they were here. And then the Ojibwe, uh, well, the D Dakotas are the descendants of the Woodland Mound Builders. Then you have the Seven Fires Prophecy, which I'm not gonna get into, but it leads to the Ojibwe arriving here eventually after Madeline Island. And by the time uh, uh, Graceland and Sir Duluth uh, shows up in Duluth in 1679, um, there is a well-established village there in Fond du Lac. Um, the village is on Nakuk Island, which is sort of across the river or in the middle of the river from Fond du Lac. And I did not know this, but I was reading in uh, Tony Durkin's book that originally uh, the Ojibwe and the Dakota got along fine. It was really the French and Indian Wars and the changes in the fur trade that led to the separation and Dakotas moving further west. And so when, and of course the first industry on the river is the fur trade, right? So beavers, they, they are the ones that are the keystone species that, that, you know, I just, I just, um, kayaked through, uh, from Oliver to the Red River and I saw 10 different beavers, right? And, and so to have them removed the way they were, I'm sure had a huge impact. But as far as like major, um, major impact on the river itself, we don't, we can't even fathom that because it happened so long ago. So there's Nakuk Island in the St. Louis River. And that was the main village down in that section of the river. It's interesting because this, this photo was originally labeled as the Pigeon River. And apparently that is not the case. It's Nakuk Island in the St. Louis River. They also farmed on the Beaver Island, which was right next to it. So the fur trade changed dramatically everything that was going on. But then we got into uh, the American, John Jacob Astor forming the American Fur Company. Um, oh, I'll just go back to this. This is Spirit Island. That was the island that they, the, where they found the Manu Min, the uh, wild rice. Um, and this is of course the most sacred site on the, on the St. Louis River. And there are some, Birch bark wigwams and canoes in Fond du Lac very early, 1869, with the canoes, birch bark canoes. And just some folks on the river harvesting wild rice and using boats on the river itself. And I had never seen this photo, but this is how the wild rice is secured before it is harvested. Which looks really cool. Okay, so the uh, John, John Jacob Astor was our basically America's first multimillionaire. He builds a uh, fur trading post. Uh, the original fur trading post owned by the French was on Connors Point in Superior. But then it was moved to Fond du Lac when John Jacob Astor came along. Um, they, he took over the Northwest company interest, company's interests and his facility eventually included a two-story trading facility, a granary, an ice house, a stable, a dormitory. All of these things were going on there, uh, including a vegetable garden, a graveyard, which if you have paid any attention to Fond du Lac, you'll see that they, when they started redoing the road, they had 
all that those tents there and they were going through the soil and the reason that was happening is because that cemetery is supposed to have been moved up to the Hussein cemetery and they found that not all of the folks were moved <laughs> there's my beaver uh the island in st louis river it moves to logging so by 1850s 1854 you have the treaty and people start to move to the minnesota side of the river and here we have a photo of a tug moving logs in the river um and you know the logging situation was uh overwhelming right if you've ever seen if you ever see pictures of uh Duluth in its earliest days I the most frequent comment I get from people is where are all the trees you know it's just stumpage it's stumpage for miles and miles and miles so you have uh improvements of steam power railroads band saws in 1880s and then it peaks the the lumber uh or the timber harvesting peaks in about 19 1905, and then it's completely over in about 20 years. And you can see what that looked like. This would be Ron Rice's point or 39th Avenue West. Um, the multiple board feet. At the height of this, we had about 15 sawmills down by the river, but by 1925, the industry was basically over and we only had one mill left. And of course, you can imagine the major impacts this would have had on the shore, on the river bottom itself. And of course, there, uh, when Gina talks, she'll talk about some of the places where you, you know, because you're a member of this organization, that there are places where sawdust was dumped into the lake in copious quantities, um, where you still find uh, logs that have sort of, in, you know, headed right into the muck and stayed there. Um, it was extremely, I mean, look at the, you can see in this photo what the stream uh, beds or the edges of the, the river looked like, the, the shores of the river and how they were gouged out by the logs as they went, were sluicing down from all over, way up north, all, all through the river. The Cloquet River, in fact, was one that was used a great deal as well. And here is a photo of the railroad going through the river in around that area as well. Um, with steam saw, the invention of the band saw, the railroads and steam power, that's, that's really kind of peaking the whole idea of, of, of taking all the timber. And of course, Thompson Dam. Thompson Dam in 1907 was a huge, uh, supposed to make us the big city, right? We were going to be the like New York, like, like Chicago. And it was just lucky, basically because of the panics. There were three panics in the end of the 1800s. One, 1857, which just after Duluth formed and which emptied out the town the first time. 1873, that's the Jay Cook panic. And that changed a lot when it came to timber and just the growing of our city. And then 1893, which uh, impacted what happened with some of the other industry in that end. This would be the US Steel site circa 1956. And you can see how it is. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> that's our big super fun site, right? Um, and I'm sure Gina will talk more about that. and the shipyard out in Riverside. This is circa 1919, so just after World War I, World War II, it peaked. And I'm, in, I'm just amazed looking at this picture at how big these boats are and what they're doing in that. Because if you go into that part of the river now, it's just quiet, there's nothing there at all. The McDougal Duluth shipyard was a huge impact on our community. And I did steal some stuff from Andrea's paper that she wrote. She's the one that turned me on to St. Louis. And this is sort of a, um, this is a town, a paper town that happened over by the Red River. 
um, which is a tiny little river on the south part of the St. It goes off to the south from the St. Louis River. And it's a paper town means that they planned one and then and it didn't really happen. So in 1890, this is a huge deal. There's like, they've bought all this property. They put this uh, 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 ad in the paper. You could come buy these things. And I just want to read some of this because it, it, it kind of tells you what could have happened um, in Duluth if it had become what they said they wanted it to become. Um, Finest location in the world for manufacturing establishments, eight miles from Duluth up the St. Louis River and on the Wisconsin side is the new town of St. Louis, the splendid property of the St. Louis Land Improvement Company. The company started with a princely capital of $1 million and has acquired 2,000 acres of table and bottom land. And on this is to grow up a city with a rapidity comp comparable only with the swift creations of an enchanter's wand. The St. Louis company's property occupies a situation having on one hand, deep water navigation, and on the other, the uh, falls of the St. Louis River. It lies at the nearest available point to this noble water power. The direct application of the force of falling water to the manufacturing purposes of man is antiquated. So now it's all gonna be a lot about electricity. I'm just sort of uh, skipping a bit. From the falls of the St. Louis, electric power can be furnished to manufacturers at St. Louis at one half the price that must be charged for the same power when generated by steam. And the St. Louis Land Improvement Company already have closed a contract with the St. Louis Water Power Company by which electric power is to be furnished at any point in the town of St. Louis at less than one half what steam power would cost. The location of the company's land is exquisite, five or 600 acres of bottom lands on the river. The shores are so indented that a mile of river affords four miles of dock front with, a small expense, with small expense for development. From the river bottom, table lands rise by gentle slopes for two miles up to and beyond the main line of the Northern Pacific Railroad. The easy grades of these table lands furnish a natural drainage, which is simply perfect. The high lands abound in springs of pure cold water, which the, uh, which would, the gradation will carry through pipes to the tops of the highest buildings on the river bottom. So I'm trying to imagine giant skyscrapers across from Fond du Lac, you know, this entire area was supposed to look like that, right? It was all going to be, that was the, those were all the grand pan, plans of the boosters. And so I guess, I mean, what I would say is we're lucky for those panics because if we hadn't had those panics in 1890, that may have been what we ended up with. And this is what's left of St. Louis, which is just basically what was a hotel and a sawmill and a flour mill. And this picture is taken by Andrea <laughs> Krauss. Um, it's all that's left. And I, I've not been there because I never get out of my boat. <laughs> so I should probably do that. But uh, it looks really interesting. Um, probably very overgrown in the summer. Better to go when it's not quite so overgrown. It looks like this was early spring or late fall. And this is where it was located. You can kind of see where that, where that line is coming from New Duluth South. Oh, it doesn't really show on the screen, but it's just below that where the, the river is going in, the Red River, where you see the word river. It's before that and it's below down. If, you, if you've gone on the river lately, you will see that it, there is nothing there, right? It's just, there's nothing at all. One thing that leads us to the present a bit is the fact that um, there was a lot of recreation eventually on the St. Louis and they were big boats and they went from uh, the docks in Fond du Lac. And so I'm just ending on more of a, of a pleasant note in that people were participating. There's another boat in the background of this shot and it was a normal Sunday or any day really, but especially on a Sunday, it was a very popular thing circa 1900, 1880s to take a jaunt on one of these river boats and see what's going on down there. Lots of camping, camping randomly, um, picnics, swimming,
And this is Bay Ridge Island with West Duluth in the background with pilings. And people camping on, uh, I believe, Spirit Island, which seems inappropriate today. And Big Island, which is the other name for Clough Island or Whiteside Island. And this underneath the Oliver Bridge, folks, circa 1906. And just that final shot. And I'm going to end it up with just this photo from the uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency that kind of gives the, so I stole this image from their uh, PCA uh, areas of concern. And so you can see what the major pollution sites are based on what we had. And I'm handing it off to Gina because she can talk about all of the pollution issues. <laughs> Let me unshare first, hold on, how do I do that? Let's see. Did that work? Oh, I'm still sharing. Let's see it. Maybe if you have to unshare, you just stop right. share, I'm Heidi, because I don't think I can. There's only one person at a time. Right, and I'm trying to see it, and I, it doesn't show that I'm sharing. Why is that? Maybe at the top. Option. No, that's not it. Um, I'll tell you what. I'll. Un, I'll oh, I'm gonna try something. Uh, there we go. Did that work? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, looks like I'm gonna get mine the right way. There we go. <laughs> Ah, some of this might be too big for the screen. Oh, well. Uh, well, hi, anything Andrea or Alyssa need to jump in with? Not right now? Okay, great. Well, thank you, Heidi. Um, I'm not so sure that I would say I'm an expert either um, about the St. Louis River. I do have uh, some history of working with various organizations that have worked on cleaning up the river over the years. Um, including WLCSD and the St. Louis River Alliance. It's been a while now, but um, I was able to conduct some oral history interviews years ago, and many of these stories um, were shared um, to me and to the archives by people who were there. And there's a lot, it's hard to do justice in a very short presentation, but I do want to um, go back a little bit to what Heidi had said, the river, we all know the river in its current state. We know some of the history, but I think it's really hard for people to kind of get their head around what it was like. It was an industrial site, you know, um, all up and down. This is obviously the harbor. This is about where the deck is um, today. Oh, and I should say also, my pictures are mostly coming from um, the Minnesota Digital Library, which is online sources. And these particular images, a lot of them were submitted by the UMD archives and the Northeastern Minnesota Historical Center um, entity themselves. And I have a few sources from the public library as well. So here, this is obviously the bridge, but you can see this is about where the deck is now. This was coal docks. There was a lot going on down on the harbor. Um, I think people fail to even think about what the environment, like even how it would have smelled and looked um, with all of the coal burning. Um, you can see all these ships. This is 1907, some ships waiting for um, loading. They had somehow a backup that day. So I think, um, and even, you know, buildings were burning coal at that time. It just was not necessarily a pleasant place to hang out. And it was not necessarily used as such, especially closer into town. Fond du Lac, as Heidi mentioned, was nice. Um, there were some other excursions that would try to leave from the Duluth area. Here's one in 1898 that were the um, Duluth Shriners. I have some musicians there on the bow. Um, that you can kind of, I think this picture, it kind of looks a little smoky, you know? <laughs> so I think people were trying you know, this is a beautiful river, let's get out. But it also, there was just a lot of smoke and mess and noise and 
just not a pleasant place to be. I also suspect, I don't have a lot of hard numbers on this, but in the 1890s, people were still using it more for recreation. And then as industry came up more, they had to move the location of the boat club uh, out farther onto Park Point. They didn't want to have as much recreation happening in the, in the harbor anymore because it just really wasn't, wasn't fitting in yet with um, anymore with what else was going on. So recreation, um, if I go back a little bit, recreation was definitely um, impacted and this was an issue. There was a lot going on there. But as you think about the St. Louis River is of course the largest tributary into Lake Superior. And Duluth way back, you know, when it first started, um, Lake Superior is a great source of drinking water, right? We can just take the water right out of the lake, drink it, it's great. Uh, St. Louis River, not, not anymore, but they were pretty pleased to find such a great drinking source back then. Uh, but the St. Louis River, of course, is flowing right into the lake. And so where the city of Duluth chose to get their water for their drinking water um, was very much affected by what was being dumped into the river. And here's a city engineer's report from 1929. And they were actually kind of proud of these numbers, these typhoid deaths um, in the city of Duluth from you can see starting in 1901 to 1928, they were doing great uh, because they had moved the water intake up north <laughs> to the Lakewood pumping station. So you can, these are some numbers that I had pulled years ago. Um, we had 266 people die in the city of Duluth in 1888 of typhoid. It may have been caused by various things, but typhoid is definitely a waterborne disease. And they were taking in water from 15th Avenue East at that point. Um, they did move up their drinking water sources. Then again to Lakewood in 1898, they still had some issues until they started doing other treatment like um, liquid chlorine and some retention basins and things like that. And so we got down to finally by the 40s, nobody was dying of typhoid in Duluth uh, from the drinking water anymore. But you can see this is another little image from the 1929 report to the city council regarding city sewers, the disposal of sewage and its effect upon the river, harbor and lake. You can see in this little teeny circle here I have, um, they had 12 sewer outlets in the nine miles between Duluth and the water works intake, they were calling it there in uh, up on Lakewood Road. So that was still obviously some input. So we had you know, you have the river looking unpleasant, you have all of these toxic industry things happening, but you also just have people dying from typhoid. You have both industrial input and you have wastewater sewage input. So this was a concern for lots of reasons. Um, and all over the country, of course, you hear about the Cuyahoga River burning in the 1960s. There was lots of um, public attention that was being given to environmental problems. Um, finally all over the country. In Duluth, it really started, seems to have started in the 50s. There were some business groups and some sportsmen's groups that were concerned about what is happening to our river, what is happening to our drinking water, why can't we catch fish out here anymore? <laughs> um, this one is 1952. Willard Munger, who was a very important representative in this area, um, he was trying to urge this study. At least let's look at what's happening, what's going on in the river. And even the United Northern Sportsmen um, got involved. And in 1957, he was able to get $25,000 to study water pollution in Minnesota. And the sportsmen's group, this fishing organization, which actually still exists, um, were very proud of this fact. They wanted they wanted this protection of water to happen, not, not just for drinking water, but for fishing and for recreation. So that did happen, but by the late 50s, you can still see some interesting articles. This one was 1958, where they had some really intense fish kills and like thousands of dead fish all up and down the river. And they can see, I like the little quote here, this was very creative. Um, the, fish nearly dead could be seen flopping feebly in the shallows. But they said on here, the cause of death is still a mystery. Well, I, and I wonder about this article because I do think somebody probably knew what was killing the fish. Um, and at that time it was, could have been all, all sorts of number of things. 
but really a natural river environment needs oxygen. Fish need oxygen in the water. And there was a lot of dumping of all sorts of things. Actually, I could maybe, I'll scoot ahead a little bit. But even um, we had a lot of paper mills. We had industries that were not necessarily dumping anything toxic per se, but dumping a lot of organic material like sawdust. Sawdust is natural, right? But when you dump it into a river environment, the microorganisms in the river are going to break down that sawdust and use up oxygen in the process, leaving no more oxygen for the fish. And so the, they were starting to have these large die-offs. The river was smelly. The river was just an unpleasant place to be. So this really still was bothering Mr. Willard Munger. <laughs> and so he, in this article here from 1961, he's listed as the most happy fella in the state legislature was Representative Willard Munger. And he'd been fighting for 10 years to set up sanitary sewer districts, which maybe doesn't sound too exciting, but that was a really key piece of legislation to start putting together larger groups and larger um, cooperative efforts to properly treat wastewater treatment, properly wa treat wastewater and deal with some of these inputs. And I find this really interesting. This is a 1972 campaign um, literature from Willard Munger's campaign. And he says, we can have industry, fishing, and recreation on the same river if we so choose. And this was, you can see, there's a couple things there. In 1971, um, Governor Wendell Anderson signed his, what, Munger's, um, St. Louis, the St. Louis River Sanitary District, or as they later called the Western Lake Superior Sanitary District bill. And so that was in the early 70s. Something else might sound familiar in the early 70s, 1972 was the uh, Clean Water Act. So there was a lot going on nationally. Um, 19, in the early 1970s, um, one of the first executive directors of WLSSD, the West, who says he came up with the name himself, was um, Ben Boo, who had been a mayor in Duluth. He just passed away um, about a year, not even a year ago, I think. Um, he was instrumental in getting WLSSD started, but he would like to credit Grant Merritt, who also just recently passed away, unfortunately, as a tenacious environmentalist in his role as the director of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And he wanted to get the river cleaned up and the process began. This is where I just step back a little bit and say, why, why I have all these stories in my head? And it's, again, hard to do it justice in this short amount of time. Um, but in 2010, the Minnesota Historical Society funded um, an oral history project to interview 14 of these key people who were involved with pushing to get the river cleaned up. Willard Munger had passed away, but I interviewed his nephew, who had written a book about him, um, and some of the original board members and lawyers. And it was really a great way to capture some of the stories and motivations and even trying to look at what was the river like before WLCC. It's hard to find pictures. Um, there aren't that many pictures of, of really messy, dead fish all over the place kind of pictures. So we've tried to kind of take a snapshot in time and try to mine some memories from the late 60s and the early 1970s. These were all recorded and transcribed, and they are available at the UMD archives, um, the special collections at the Catherine A. Martin Library, um, and they are available to researchers or anyone who's interested. Um, I was an independent oral historian that was um, getting this funding from the Historical Society so that these interviews could be um, recorded and saved in the archives for perpetuity. So if this sparks any interest of you, you are interested, anyone here, you are very welcome to contact them and get all those transcripts. I'll talk about that at the end. But so if we go back to Ben Boo, I think he was one of the first people I interviewed. And he really, again, remembered a lot of just how this came to be and what was going on. And we had all the, the industries in Cloquet, especially, were doing a lot of um, adding materials to the river. The rivers were just great sewers, right? They were just great. It would just take the waste away. It would just go away. Um, and obviously that wasn't going to work long term. So as Ben Boo said, Grant Merritt saw that the culprits were 
Northwest Paper, Conwed, the, the Renshaw Refinery, Conoco. It was a, a threat to the cloquet industry because they really felt we can't, we can just have to stop using the river as a point of distribution for effluent. It's more than that. And that did create some turmoil, but the stars were lining up. There were money, there was money available. Um, the cleanup, as he said, the cleanup of the river was an economic necessity. They did need those jobs in Cloquet. They wanted to figure out how to do this. And it was very economical to combine all of the effluents that were being dumped into the river all the way up into Cloquet, all the way down into Duluth, all the way to Duluth's um, residential sewage was all getting dumped in many, many different various places along the river. And so we finally got in that early 70s, that synergy of the environmentalists and the industry saying, okay, we gotta, we gotta do this. Um, something else, I talked to the city attorney that um, was in Cloquet in the late 60s. And he also worked for WSSC in the early 70s named Larry Yetka. And he was very proud of a deal that he had brokered between Cloquet and the city of Duluth for a water line. The cities, the industries in Cloquet needed cleaner water. They needed water probably from Lake Superior that had less, fewer tannins and things in it. And Duluth mayors had said, no, we don't want to do that for you. And there had been a, finally a breakthrough, I believe with Ben Boo, to get this water line to Cloquet. And so then Cloquet was, this industries were a little bit more willing to play nice and um, figure out how we could get this done. So the story was really a lot of compromise of people working together, looking at funding. Um, it was not, this is uh, Dave Zentner. He was one of the first WLCC board members back in the seventies. Um, and he said, it was very important to remember it was not an unfunded mandate that you know local people didn't just say okay we got to do this there was a lot of federal funding and uh, it was 75 percent federal funding 15 percent state funding and only 10 percent local funding so that was a really important piece as well so in the 1970s so we got this all going was working together this is a picture um you can see the the arena or what's now the deck kind of there over by the bridge and this was 1973. So things were starting to happen. They had, you know, the deck, the arena area was built in the 60s, late 60s, I believe 66. Um, but you still had all this dumping happening and you still had the river smelling and you had things, dead fish, whatnot. Um, so this one I thought was kind of illustrative. There aren't that many again of the, of the mess and that could just be sediment, but that was happening. And so finally in 1974, they were able to break ground for the new and modern sanitary district. Here's, there's Willard Munger <laughs> and Ben Boo over there on the left, I think. Um, they were very proud again of this water pollution control facility that they were going to build. Eventually it did turn into also solid waste authority. It's actually a special governmental unit that was created to address pollution in this area. So WLCC still to this day is considered a special governmental unit. They're not really a county, they're not really a town, they're their own little thing that was created in the 70s to get this done. So that groundbreaking happened in the fall of 74. There actually had been an old wastewater treatment plant that was a little bit more probably considered 25th Avenue West. There's a picture that shows it. You can kind of see Michigan Street there. So there was a wastewater plant there. I did work at WLCC um, 10, 15 years ago, working with um, some of the old treatment operators. And they were like, oh yeah, those used to be able to go out and pick tomatoes. Cause you know, they dumped the sludge out on the, on the shore right there. And then we'd just get really great tomato plants growing. So you can imagine, so this was wastewater. <laughs> that was coming through from people and uh, the seeds were not, were still viable when they came through the process. So um, you had some very well fertilized tomato plants apparently coming out all around that plant. So that was, and they said, some people just ate them for lunch. It was fine. Um, <laughs> you have a little different, different queasiness factor when you work at a wastewater plant, I think. So there was, a, there was an old neighborhood in that area that WSSC is now, they called it Slab Town. 
there were a few houses down below the railroad tracks you could see there, but not, not a lot. Um, but they cleared that, that site, um, made it ready for the new plant that they were going to build. And of course we have that today. It was built in the seventies. You can still see over here on the, on the far right, there's two little domes that actually do date back to the wastewater plant that was there in the 1930s. Um, but by 1978 is when they had it all go online. Um, they took 17 separate discharges that had happened at industries and towns and everything along the river and they put it all in this one place and basically um, recreated the river environment in a much more intense way so that you could have the microorganisms being in contact with the wastewater they were able to filter, they were able to um, oxygenate and do things that, that might have eventually happened naturally in the river, um, if especially with like organic waste, but you, they could do it much more quickly, much more efficiently. And then that water that goes back out to the river is heavily regulated by the MPCA and other places. It's not perfect, uh, but it definitely is a, an improvement from what we had pre-1978. Here's a picture of, I believe this was Lyle Brand. We used to think this was Willard Munger, but this was sometime in the late 50s, early 60s. That's just pure sludge covering the river. Um, and so we went from, you know, dead fish and sludge to, to now what we have. The river itself, they were proud of the fact that it basically cleaned itself up within just a few, <laughs> like a year afterwards, if you stop dumping all this waste right away into the river, a lot of things did improve really quickly. Um, we, there was oxygen, fish were not suffocating. But of course, just having a wastewater treatment plant that takes industrial waste and local waste is not gonna fix all the legacy pollution problems and all those sediments and all the things that were dumped um, from the steel plant and other things farther up the river. But I like to say we have sort of had we have the luxury now, We the fish are not dead. And so now we can study them and we can look for the effects of hormones and we can look at the effects of medication, EFOS. We can look more at things like microplastics. We can look at much more subtle problems now because we're not just using, WLC, or using the river as a sewer and just dumping everything in directly. So again, here's the, the sources. Um, these pictures are amazing. You can find so many things online yourself if you're interested in some of these histories. If you go to the Minnesota Digital Library and just search St. Louis River or St. Louis Harbor, you will, or Duluth Harbor, you will find so many things. And also the archives at UMD um, has all of these interviews. I can't do justice to 10 hours and pages and pages of transcripts <laughs> in this, in this um, but they are available there. Also, there's a display that is um, currently at the depot that uses some of the quotes and images from, from the oral history project that I did. Um, so I did not get to everything that Heidi promised. If anyone has other questions, um, I'd be happy to address that. Uh, there's a lot of different directions you can go. I guess I didn't have here the year. So now um, with the AOC, I did used to work for the St. Louis River Alliance too. There's so much happening now that is beyond WLCC. WLCC is still very important and we're treating that wastewater on a daily basis, but now we can work on all of these other projects that are addressing all of these older problems and the future. Use of for good recreation. All right. So yeah, be happy to answer questions or get into other things, or if you guys have anything to add. Let me add that. Thanks, Gina. <laughs> I do see a um, a question. Uh, Tom oh, Hollenhurst. Tom Hollenhurst asked, "Who's Lyle Graham?" Oh, <laughs> Lyle Brand, I believe it was, and I'm sure I threw that out there. Um, I don't remember who he was. We we used to say that was um, Willard Munger, and in the process of making the display that the St. Louis Historical Society has at the depot right now they realized it was not him it was a different maybe colleague someone that worked in the industry but yeah sorry
there were a lot of key people working on this. There were um, WSSD's board had nine members and their agreement was that they had to have seven um, people agree. They had, they wasn't, it wasn't just a, a simple majority, they needed seven. And they also, they had um, Duluth's first female uh, lawyer um, was, was on the board. Um, Waters was her last name. <laughs> um, so the other was, a, it's, it's really fascinating just to go back and hear some of these people that were active in those times when it was still kind of a new idea that we shouldn't just dump sewage in the river. <laughs> There's a question in here from Carol Reschke too. Do you know where the photo of the sludge on the river was taken? We don't, not very well. Again, there aren't very many pictures. I could bring that picture up again. Um, I'm still sharing my screen, aren't I? Yep. Should I do that? Let's see, let me go back. Go back, go back. <laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah, it is a cool picture. I, you know, I wish we had more. It was originally from, WLCSD has it in their scrapbooks. <laughs> I don't think it's actually on the Minnesota Digital Library at all. Um, and they have used it for that display. So I might recommend, I don't work at WLCC anymore. <laughs> so I might recommend they double check where that is. I believe they have it in a display in their lobby as well. Um, so they, yeah, it looks like there's some rocks back there. Yeah, it's a little, little unclear, but I really, I wished that we had more pictures of, of the bad days. I see, yeah, maybe Carlton. Uh, Tom Hollenhorst is saying maybe Carlton by the dam. Yep, very well could have been. There also were quotes from people that said, you know, you would drive across the bridges like over to Superior and it would just be foam, just would be like billowing up underneath the bridges and just was really unpleasant. And John Pigors, I see Stephanie Hemphill is asking. Yes, I believe he worked for the MPCA. Was he an MPCA commissioner um, at that? Yeah, and no fires. No fires that I know of, Tom. Um, I think we did not have oil and a lot of um, flammable wastes going into the river. A lot of our um, problems were wood and wood waste and sludge like that. That was not necessarily flammable. Um, but really not good for an aquatic environment if you need some oxygen. Um, struggle. Should I stop sharing, sharing my screen if you guys want to share anything? Sure, yeah, if you want to, that's fine. We can, people can turn on their videos if they want um, and, and ask questions. There's another one here too, a number of comments thanking you for the, the presentation and wanting to go and explore some of these areas now. Um, Sophia Green asks if you have any recommendations for sources or where to look to create historical timeline of events in Kingsbury Bay and Grassy Point areas on the St. Louis River estuary. Hmm. You get, you, Andrea, might be better, or well, uh, Alyssa, maybe. <laughs> I don't off the top of my head. Although I will a plug for the for the public library, we have um, they have lots of clippings of lots and lots of stories of things that were happening on the river at that time. So that that could be. Um, but I think probably with the AOC, there's some good history. Um, some of the documents there, the history of what was going on where. Is that right? Yeah, I have a question. This is Tom. Can you hear me? Yep. I'm not sure my camera's working. So yes. I had a conversation with somebody once about coal gas and coal gas that was used for lighting. And they said, if you want to know where any contaminated places are, brownfield sites and so forth, look to where those old maps were, where they had coal gasification plants. And it seemed like they had them throughout the, the two cities because they were lighting streetlights with coal gas at the very beginning. Have you ever come across that? 
do you guys have Alyssa? There's a map somewhere um, that talks about all the uses of the river, the shoreline uses. And do you are you familiar yeah, with that? I haven't seen that, but okay. I would love if anybody has that link to share I, it. I've, I've seen pictures of what they look like in the, it, almost like what the refinery tanks look like, and they could expand. Mm -hmm. I think they could push up. So they would put coal in there, I think, and and maybe heat it without oxygen and it would push the gas out of it. I'm not sure the process, mm -hmm. but it would expand like a balloon almost. And then they would light street lights and things with that. Wow. And, and maybe yeah, I can't say there wasn't any flammable material going into the lake or to the river. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> who knows? But that would be the, where the where the brownfield sites might be, where those locations were. Yeah. Yeah. I I could dig into that a little bit more too. Because I know there was a study done probably in like the 80s where they were trying to look at historical land uses quite a bit along the river. And I just don't have that at hand, but we mm -hmm. can we can try to find it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other uh questions or comments from folks. I saw uh, um, a lot of information in the chat about the um, the panic, the, the different panics in the mid late 1800s. Thanks for responding with some of that information, Heidi. I'll just mention too, we are a member organization. Would love to, if you're not a member, please consider becoming a member of the St. Louis River Alliance. Um, we have some pretty great member benefits in terms of experiences on the river, but even if you're not a member, you can still join us for our events like this. Um, and of course you can always donate to our work and follow up on what we're, what we're doing with the area of concern and the National Water Trail um, to help get more people out on the river. I was curious if either of you have a specific book that you'd recommend for Twin Ports history, something that might have, you know, comprehensive. Uh. I wish there was just one, but as Heidi mentioned, Tony Durkin's work, he's collected a lot about the city. Um, maybe not as much natural history, but definitely a lot of the industrial or the, the building history. Um, and the, the website that he runs, the Zenith City Online is excellent too. So you don't, it's not just a book, but yes, the library definitely has books by Tony and others to check out uh, regarding History. I don't off the top of my head know of any books that are specifically about the river, other than the St. Louis River Alliance on the Water Guide, <laughs> right, which was published years ago um, with just some history a little bit along the river. And we do still have a few of those. If anybody wants them, just um, send me an email and we can arrange a time to get one. I'll put that in the chat right now. I have a question. Um, have you looked at Edmund Ely's history? I don't think so. Heidi, have you? I'm not familiar with that one, actually. I mean, I've read the 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 Woodbridge and the and the other the Van Brunt, which are just you know <laughs> they're gigantic. But I have mm -hmm. not read that one. I've read. And, well, yeah, most of the ones that are in the public library, I've actually read. I'm probably one of five people that have read Woodbridge in the Van Brunts, which are these <laughs> giant leather bound tomes. But um, no, I've never read the Edmund Ely's history. I assume, it, oh yeah, right. He was the missionary at Fond du Lac. Yeah, mm. and, and I wasn't his child the first white child born? I think so lose proper so you know yeah very interesting i i think i have read parts of it that makes sense now i remember it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm curious if either of you um have read anything any accounts of like the um what early 
uh, European explorers described the area as when they came into the estuary, what they were seeing, like pre-industrialization? It's, I mean, Duluth, uh, Daniel Graysill and Sir Duluth did not write much about it. I know, they know he dragged his canoe over the portage, which is where the canal is, right? Um, in 8, 1679, he was on his way, but, but Grosseur and Radisson, they were the two who were here in 1659. And they, they were the, really the first European explorers. I don't know anything about what they wrote about that. I, I have not perused their descriptions. Um, I do, uh, the, the thing, when people say that, what I mostly think about is Fremont. And Fremont was a bunch of boggy islands that were right around where Rice's Point is, kind of like between two of the points. And it was all just this, and when they, when they opened the canal, all those bogs went sweeping out into the lake and broke up into pieces. And there's a rumor, a it's kind of a joke by Van Brunt's son, who they got, they took their boat out and they got, they climbed onto one of them and then they rode it. They put a, ran a flag up on one of the trees and they rode it out into the lake. I don't know how realistic that is, but it's, but I imagine so much more wetlands, you know, so much more, well, the wild rice, of course, all, all of those things were dredged out. And, you know, it, it was a lot shallower, and there was a lot more going on, I'm sure. But as far as just, you know, actual descriptions that one can read that are contemporaneous, I don't know. Yep, the humans, I think the, the industrialization very much, you know, they cleaned up the edges, built the docks on the edges. Um, and the area, I think, if you look way back, just the idea of an estuary is such a productive area. There was a lot of good food here. Um, and it was a really great place for Native people to live and, you know, get make their living with the food and the natural resources. Um, and then the, the Europeans came up with their other ways to use the space. Well, this is, I, I could ask you a bunch of questions and keep you here for a long time, but I'm not gonna do that. I wanna respect your time, appreciate um, what you've already uh, given us for, for this experience and the history and um, so thank you so much, Gina, Heidi, uh, for these presentations, for your time, for the work that you've done to assemble this information, like as part of the oral histories and, and the work that you both do as, as researchers and historians to, to document this. Um, so a lot of gratitude for you all. Um, Thank you to Alyssa who makes all of this possible and gets us all, all in this room, to, this Zoom room together. Um, and you'll probably notice in the chat, there's a number of links to the St. Louis River Alliance webpage where you can find out more about some of our projects, how to get involved. Um, if you're interested in those Water Wednesday, the paddling events, um, you can find out more about that as well. Uh, but thank you everyone for being here. Um, have a have a great evening and um, enjoy the the kickoff to our the end of summer and beginning of or end of spring, beginning of summer, um, sometime soon here. We'll see you on the water. Thanks. I'm good.